No, not I. Flint was captain. I was quartermaster along with my timber leg. The same broadside I lost my leg, old Pew lost his deadlights. It was a master surgeon, him that amputated me. Out of college and all. Latin by the bucket and what not. But he was hanged like a dog and sun-dried like the rest at Corso Castle. That was Robert's men, that was. And come of changing names to their ships. Royal Fortune and so on. Now, what a ship was christened, so let her stay, I says. So it was with the Cassandra, as brought us all home safe from Malabar, after England took the Viceroy of the Indies. So it was with the old walrus, Flint's old ship. As I've seen a muck with the red blood and fit to sink with gold. Ah cried another voice, that of the youngest hand on board, and evidently full of admiration. He was the flower of the flock, was Flint. Davis was a man, too, by all accounts. I never sailed along of him, first with England, then with Flint, that's my story. And now here on my own account, in a manner of speaking. I laid by nine hundred safe from England, and two thousand after Flint. That ain't bad for a man before the mast, all safe in bank. Taint earning now, it savings does it, and you may lay to that. Where's all England's men now? I don't know. Where's Flint's? Why, most of them aboard here, and glad to get the duff. Been begging before that, some of them. Old Pew has lost his sight and might have thought shame. Spends twelve hundred pounds a year like a lord in Parliament. Where is he now? Well, he's dead now and under hatches. But for two years before that, shiver me timbers, the man was starving. He begged and he stole and he cut throats and starved at that. By the powers! Well, it ain't much use after all, said the young seaman. Tain't much use for fools, you may lay to that. That nor nothing. But now you look here. You're young, you are. But you're smart as paint. I see that when I set my eyes on you. And I'll talk to you like a man. You may imagine how I felt when I heard this abominable old rogue addressing another in the very same words of flattery as he had used to myself. I think, if I had been able, that I would have killed him through the barrel. Meanwhile, he ran on, little supposing he was overheard. Here it is about gentlemen of fortune. They lives rough, and they risk swinging, but they eat and drink like fighting cocks, and when a cruise is done, why, it's hundreds of pounds instead of hundreds of farthings in their pockets. Now, the most goes for rum and a good fling, and to see again in their shirts, but that's not the course I lay. I puts it all away, some here, some there, and none too much anywheres. By reason of suspicion, I'm fifty, mark you. Once back from this cruise, I set up gentlemen in earnest, Time enough too, says you are, but I've lived easy in the meantime. Never denied myself anything that my heart desires, and slept soft and ate daintily all my days. But when at sea, and how did I begin? Before the mast, like you. Well, said the other, but all the other money's gone now, ain't it? You daren't show your face in Bristol after this. Why, where might you suppose it was? asked Silver. At Bristol, in banks and places, answered his companion. It were, said the cook, it were when we weighed anchor. But my old missus has it all by now, and the spyglass is sold. Lease and goodwill and rigging, and the old girl's off to meet me. I would tell you where, for I trust you, but it would make jealousy among the mates. And you can trust your missus, asked the other. Gentlemen of fortune, returned the cook. Usually trust little among themselves, and right they are, you may lay to it. But I have a way with me, I have. When a mate brings a slip on his cable, one as knows me, I mean. It won't be in the same world with old John. There was some that was feared of Pew and some that was feared of Flint. But Flint, his own self, was feared of me. Feared he was, and proud. They were the roughest crew afloat, was Flint's the devil himself would have been feared to go to sea with them. Well, now I tell you, I'm not a boasting man, and you've seen yourself how easy I keep company. But when I was quartermaster, lambs wasn't the word for Flint's old buccaneers. Ah, you may be sure of yourself in old Flint's ship. Well, I tell you now, replied the lad, I didn't half a quarter like the job till I had this talk with you, John. But there's my hand on it now. And a brave lad you were, and smart too. A finer figurehead for a gentleman of fortune I never clapped my eyes on. By this time I had begun to understand the meaning of their terms. By a gentleman of fortune, they plainly meant neither more nor less than a common pirate. And the little scene that I had overheard was the last act in the corruption of one of the honest hands, perhaps of the last one left aboard. But on this point I was soon to be relieved, for Silver giving a little whistle, a third man strolled up and sat down by the party. Dick Square, said Silver. Oh, I know Dick was square, returned the voice of the coxswain, Israel Hands. He's no fool, is Dick. And he turned his quid and spat. But look here, how long are we going to stand off and on like a blessed bumboat? I've had almost enough to Captain Smollett. He's hazed me long enough by thunder. I want to go into that cabin, I do, and I want them pickles and wines in that. 
Israel, said Silver, your head ain't much account, nor never was. But you're able to hear, I reckon, leastways with your ears are big enough. Now here's what I say. You'll birth forward, and you'll live hard, and you'll speak soft, and you'll keep sober till I give the word. And you may lay to that, old son. Well, I don't say no, do I? growled the coxswain. What I say is when. That's what I say. When? By the powers! cried Silver. Well, now if you want to know, I'll tell you when. The last moment I can manage, and that's when. He's a first-rate seaman, Captain Smollett. Sails the blessed ship for it, he does. Here's this squire and doctor with a map and such. I don't know where it is. Do you? No more do you, says you. Well then, I mean this squire and doctor shall find the stuff and help us to get it aboard by the powers. Then we'll see. If I was sure of you all, sons of double Dutchmen, I'd have Captain Smollett navigate us halfway back again before I struck. Why? We're all seamen aboard, I should think, said the lad Dick. We're all foxhole hands, you mean. We can steer a course, but who's to set one? That's what all you gentlemen split on. First and last. If I had my way, I'd have Captain Smollett work us back into the trades at least. Then we'd have no blessed miscalculations and a spoonful of water a day. But I know the sort you are. I'll finish with them at the island as soon as Blunt's on board, and a pity it is, but you'll never be happy till you're drunk. Split my sides, I've had a sick heart to sail with the likes of you. Easy all long, John, said Israel. Who's a crossin' of you? Why, how many tall ships think ye? Now, have I seen laid aboard? And how many brisk lads dine in the sun at execution dock? And all for the same hurry and hurry and hurry. You hear me? I seen a thing or two at sea, I have. If you only lay your course and pint to woodward, you would ride in the carriages, you would, but not you. I know you. You'd have a mouthful of rum tomorrow and go hang. Everybody know you was a kind of chaplain, John. But there's others who could hand and steer as well as you, said Israel. They like a bit of fun, they did. They wasn't so high and dry, no how, but took their fling. They're jolly companions, every one. So, says Silver. Well, and where are they now? Pew was that sort, and he died a beggar man. Flint was, and he died of rum at Savannah. Ah, they was a sweet crew, they was. Ah, uh, where are they? But, asked Dick, when we do lay em athwart, what are we to do with them? That's the man for me, cried the cook admiringly. That's what I call business. Well, what would you think? Put them ashore like maroons? That would have been England's way. Or cut them down like that much pork? That would have been Flint's or Billy Bones. Yeah, Billy was the man for that, said Israel. Dead men don't bite, says he. Well, he's dead now himself. He knows the long and short of it now, and if he ever a rough hand come to port, it was Billy. Right you are. Rough and ready, but mark you ear, I'm an easy man. I'm quite a gentleman, says you, but this time it's serious. Duty is duty, mates, I give my vote. Death. When I'm in Parliament and riding in my coach, I don't want none of these sea lawyers in the cabin are coming home, unlooked for like the devil at prayers. Wait is what I say, but when the time comes, why, let her rip. John, you're a man. You'll say so, Israel, when you see. Only one thing I claim, I claim Trewani. I'll wring his calf's head off his body with these hands, Dick. You just jump up like a sweet lad and give me an apple to wet my pipe. You may fancy the terror I was in. I should have leapt out and run for it. I heard Dick begin to rise, and then someone seemingly stop him, and the voice of hands exclaimed, Oh, stow that. Don't you get sucking on that bilge, John. Let's have a go at the rum. Dick, I trust you. I've a gauge on the keg, mind. There's the key. You fill a pannikin and bring it up. Terrified as I was, I could not help thinking to myself that this must have been how Mr. Arrow got the strong waters that destroyed him. Dick was gone but a little while, and during his absence Israel spoke straight on in the cook's ear. It was but a word or two that I could catch, and yet I gathered some important news, for besides other scraps that tended to the same purpose, this whole clause was audible. Not another man of them will join. Hence, there were still fateful men on board. When Dick returned, one after another of the trio took the pannikin and drank. One to luck, another was, here's to old Flint, and Silver himself saying, in a kind of song, here's to ourselves and hold your luff, plenty of prizes and plenty of duff. Just then a sort of brightness fell upon me in the barrel, and looking up, I found the moon had risen, and was silvering the mizzen top, and shining white on the luff of the foresail, and almost at the same time the voice of the lookout shouted, Land ho! When people think of pirate stories, it is nearly always the treasure island that they think. Yet Robinson Crusoe featured piracy as we think of it, and it predated Treasure Island by more than 150 years. While Treasure Island is the novel that influenced popular culture's version of piracy, it was a book called 
A General History of the Robberies and Murders of the Most Notorious Pirates by Captain Charles Johnson. Probably not his real name, and possibly not even a captain, that introduced many of the iconic elements of piracy that were going to feature in Treasure Island. The idea of patches, Long John's peg leg, and of buried treasure. It also gave a name to the Black Flag, the Jolly Roger. The book is not very remembered today, but its impact on the authors to follow can't be ignored, and it was written in 1724. Treasure Island itself is a surprisingly sophisticated book. While it certainly has a ye old book feel to it, its characters, their motivations, their language is surprisingly deep. It feels at times more like a book written today than it does when it actually was. At other times it feels right at the heart of the pirate era. In fact, it was written in 1883, only 31 years before the First World War. It's a book of characters at its heart, and I think it is for this reason that it has stood the test of time. The story itself is relatively simple. Find a map, go hunting for the treasure with the wrong crew, which leads to trouble and lots of it. But it's the characters that stand that test. Long John Silver is ruthless, and he's ruthless quite often, but there are times when it's clear he doesn't want to be, that he likes young Jim and very much wants a different course than trying to keep a bunch of bloodthirsty pirates in line. This book is most definitely a classic, and it deserves to be. Some of the classics, though, are pretentious and difficult. They are the books people put on their shelf to show they are intelligent, with no intention of reading them. Treasure Island deserves to be read. It's a solid adventure tale that doesn't disappoint.